Hi. <clears throat> so welcome you to today's lecture. So uh, pre mitsem uh, we mainly studied uh, a kind of statistical problems, uh, in fact, statistical inference problems, which are called uh, estimation problems. Uh, another kind of uh, important uh, statistical inference problems are uh, the hypothesis testing problem. You have done a bit of it at, a, at your undergraduate level or at your first course, which was MSO201. Uh, by the way, how was your mid -sem? Did it go well? Yeah? Not that much. Okay. It, it didn't go at least the bad, right? It was good. Any, any reactions on the mid-semester examination? Any feedback? Yeah, anybody? That was harder than the previous exam. That was harder than the quiz, you mean to say, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, but that's uh, perception, right? Your perception may be that this was harder, but possibly, is there, some, is there anybody for whom the quiz was harder than the medicine. It's very difficult to communicate with your people, right? You don't respond. I hope everybody is joining and anyway, I wanted to have a feedback. If you don't have any feedback, that's fine. Thanks to Soumya, at least he gave the feedback. Okay, so let me start. Uh, any other issues you would like to pass on? Any feedback you would like to give about the course? So can we uh, have uh, offline classes? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much willing to have it, but uh, is everybody in the on the campus? So not yet. Uh, that is a problem, right? Because there is this uh, institute is not providing the recording facility. Otherwise, uh, uh, let me find it out if they can provide me the recording facility that while I'm taking the lectures in the uh, Blackboard, if... Uh, so how many of you are... Hybrid mode. Yeah? Hybrid mode. Yeah, so one possibility is that I come, take the lectures. My lectures get recorded there itself. And then they are released after the lecture is over or even simultaneously, right? So that's a one model which one can think of. But I have to explore the possibility of that because the recording facility in that case will have to be provided by the Institute. I can't manage it, right? Because my camera is this right now. I'm able to manage it because I'm sitting in front of a camera. So now let me find it out if, if there is any such possibility. I would be more than glad to have you around. So how many of you would be willing to come uh, for these uh, lectures, physical lectures, if there is? No problem about that. Most of you would be willing to come? Yes, sir. Okay, so let me try. If it works out, then I'll certainly have, and then, uh, of course, this everything is based on the condition that institute is willing to provide me the recording facility. All right. Yeah, so let me just explore that. And if that is possible, I would certainly like to do that. Okay, any other feedback anybody has? Okay, if not, then let me start with uh, today's lecture, which I start with a new topic. which is on the hypothesis testing problem. Now you have done a part of it at your bachelor's level. In fact, you have done a lot of it at your bachelor's level. So there you would find some of that is being repeated over here, but there is no harm in refreshing your old stuff if it helps in clarifying your doubts, if any. Okay, so let's talk about uh, these hypothesis testing problems. 
So suppose uh, I have a random vector X, which has a PDF for quality mass function belonging to a family of PDFs. So uh, what it means is that you exactly do not know what is a PDF. At the best, you know that it belongs to some family of distributions. Like at the best, I may know that my uh, random observations have a joint distribution coming from normal distribution with mean theta and variance one, but I do not know the theta. Right? So that could be one example. Another example could be, I do not know anything about this family except for the fact that this family has continuous distributions, which is basically a non-parametric kind of a problem uh, where uh, nothing is known about the uh, uh, distribution under study. So P is a given family of PDFs. Suppose I have a partition of P in terms of P0 and P1, says that P0 and P1 are disjoint and their union is whole of P. So for example, in the normal case, it could be, uh, for example, your P could be collection of all those families, normal theta one, says so that minus infinity less than theta less than infinity. Your P0 could be again normal family, but with mean theta less than zero, less than or equal to zero. And P1 could be normal theta one, says that theta zero is zero. So suppose P0 and P1 are two partitions of P. What does partition mean? That means the sets in the partition set are disjoint and their union is whole of P. Now, based on the observed sample X, our goal is to decide which of the following statements or hypothesis is true. So one statement is that F belongs to P0. That means mean is less than or equal to zero against alternative hypothesis that F belongs to P1. Now this H0 is called the null hypothesis. H1 is called the alternative hypothesis. So generally I'm interested in testing a null hypothesis against an alternative hypothesis. Now one may be wondering why the name null comes. Null means empty or of no consequence. Uh, there is no specific reason to call it a null hypothesis. Uh, one reason could be that while you are testing any hypothesis, this you frame your hypothesis in such a way that the hypothesis which you want to test is of a status quo. That means there is no difference in what is existing and what would be done in the future. So for example, if you're uh, planning to introduce a new uh, manufacturing system, status quo would be that new manufacturing system is as good as the old one. You may like to test that against the alternative that new manufacturing system is better than the old one. That would be alternative hypothesis. So in this null hypothesis is status quo, which is saying that uh, your existing system is as good as the new system which you want to introduce. So now basically one may treat it as a status quo, but there's one should not get too much into it. It is just a name which is given to a hypothesis which you want to test. And you would like to test this hypothesis against some hypothesis which you're calling as alternative hypothesis. So suppose my sample space is sky, which is the space of all possible values of X. Now, after I have been observed X, I have to take two possible Xs. So I have to take two possible Xs after I have observed X. One Xn could be do not reject H0. A1 that reject H0. Note that I'm deliberately not writing down that accept H0. Do not reject H0 does not mean accept H0. I'm just simply saying that do not reject H0, that does not mean that accept H0. And why I mean so, why such a delicate difference is being made would be clear in the sequel when we discuss 
about how to frame your hypothesis. So there are two possible actions available to me. One action I'm calling as A0, which is do not reject S0. A1 is reject S0. Let me, what is my test function? First, I define what is my randomized test function. The way you define randomized estimator, the same way you can define a randomized test function. What will be the randomized test function? After I observe X, I take X and A0 with certain probability, and I take X and A1 with certain probability. I do not immediately decide after observing X, X what X and to take. Suddenly, probability of taking X and A1 would be one minus probability of taking X and A0, or probability of taking X and A0 would be same as one minus probability of taking X and A1, because there are only two possible actions. So it would be enough to describe only one of them, which would be probability of rejecting H0. So in such a way, what we can say is a randomized test function can be, can be described as conditional probability of rejecting H0. So after observing X equal to X, another random experiment is conducted to decide in favor of A0 or A1. There's a test function is a function phi from sample space to zero one because it is a probability such that phi x denotes the conditional probability of rejecting H0 or taking X and A1 given that X equal to X. So of course, once phi x is described, I know what is the probability of taking X and A1, sorry, A0, which would be one minus phi of X. So a randomized test function is nothing but it tells me what is the probability of taking X and A1. So of course, the probability of taking X and A0 would be one minus phi of X. So let us see this remark. If for every X belonging to X, phi X takes only two values, zero or one. That means after you have observed X, your phi immediately decides whether to reject H0 or not to reject H0. No randomization is necessary because phi x is with probability zero, you're rejecting H0. Phi x equal to one, that means with probability one, you're rejecting H0. So that means after x has been observed, you're directly taking the x with probability one or probability zero. Then after observing the sample x, no further randomization is necessary to choose from x and say zero or even. Now, as in the estimation problems we called such estimators as non-randomized estimators. Here also we call such test functions to be non-randomized test functions, which immediately after observing X have a degenerate distribution. That means phi X is zero, so one minus phi X is one. And phi X is one, that means one minus phi X is zero. Now such tests are out of time because they only take two values. So they will take one value one for certain configurations of the sample space. So one if X belongs to C and zero otherwise. Where the C, note that phi was probability of rejecting H0. So you're rejecting H0 with probability one if your sample observations falls inside C. So in a sense, C is the area of rejection of the null hypothesis H0. So where C is correction of all those X in the sample space says that phi X is one. Phi X is one means with probability one, you're rejecting H0. So this is the rejection reason or critical reason of phi for testing H0. Note that critical reason is well defined only in case of non-randomized test function. Because only in the non-randomized test function, you can say that, okay, look, this is the reason with probability one where I would reject S0. For non-randomized estimators, one cannot explicitly define the critical reason because your critical reason is random. It is collection of all those X's that phi X is one. And it could be something else, gamma also, right? So, because here with certainty, you're rejecting H0. Because where phi x is gamma, you're not rejecting H0. You're rejecting H0 only with probability gamma. So you cannot call that as a rejection reason. So what is our final goal? To find a reasonable test function phi. 
Now note that any decision we take, which is equivalent to using any test function phi, I may certain I may commit certain kind of errors. So let us look at what are the kind of errors which may come when I take any decision. So any test function phi may lead two possible errors. One error I call as a type one error, which is rejecting H naught. So I reject test decides to reject H naught, although H naught is true. Then there's a type two error, which is the test says that do not reject H naught when actually H naught is wrong or H one is true. So for any F belonging to P, I can talk about the average error which would be occurred. Right? The way you talked about the average loss, which was the risk. Because this is, as such, if you look at phi, phi is a random quantity. I can talk about the error which I would be making. So let us define B F phi, B phi F as expected value of phi of Fx. Phi X was conditional property of rejecting H naught. So expected value of phi X would be the expected probability of rejecting H naught when F is the two parametric value. So I talk about B phi F, which is expected value under F of phi X, which is expected probability of rejecting H naught when F is a two value. So this F corresponds to this substitute F you have over here. Now in general, these functions, which depends on F in P, for F belonging to P, P phi F is called the power function of test phi. Now you studied the concept of a power. This power function as such is not power. It is related to the power of a test, but it is not a power as would be clear later on. But because power is def defined only for F belonging to alternative hypothesis. This I have defined for any F in P. And we call this as a power function of a test phi. Let us look at what is power function when f is in p0. So b phi f, when f is in p0, what does that mean? b phi f was probability of rejecting h0. And f belongs to p0 means h0 is true. So I call this as expected value of type one error because this is same as probability of rejecting H naught when H naught is true because your F is belonging to P0. Now for F belonging to pi one, if I consider one minus beta phi F, beta phi F was probability of rejecting H naught. So what would be one minus beta phi F? Probability of not rejecting H naught. So I'm not rejecting H naught Whereas F is actually belonging to P1, where F is actually wrong. So this is expected value of probability of type 2N. That means probability of not rejecting H0 when H1 is true. So these are the kind of two kind of errors which one can encounter. So for F belonging to P1, 1 minus beta phi F is a probability of type 2 error. So a negation of that. I call that the power of a test. So what is a beta phi f for f belonging to pi? This is a probability of rejecting H0 because beta phi f is probability of rejecting H0. When f is in P1, well, actually H0 is wrong. So this is something high you would like to have because it's a correct decision. Because you're saying, what is the probability of rejecting H0 when actually F is in P1, that means H0 is wrong. This would be wrong, this would be high. So this is because this is a correct decision. And for this reason, it is called the power of a test. I would like to have this quantity as much high as possible. An ideal thing would be to find a test function phi naught, which uniformly minimizes beta phi F, F belonging to P0, which is probability of time one another, and 1 minus beta phi f, f belonging to p1, which is the probability of type 2 error. So you would like to have a test function phi for which the probabilities of both kind of errors are minimum. Unfortunately, that cannot be done. 
because there is a trade-off between the two kinds of errors. If you try to minimize one kind of error, the other kind of error increases. So unfortunately, beta phi f for f derived to p0, which is the probability of type 1 error, and 1 minus beta phi f for f derived to p1, which is the probability of type 2 error, cannot be minimized simultaneously. To see a glimpse of this, let us consider this example. Let us consider two test functions, phi 0 and phi 1. What is phi 0? Phi 0 is 0 for every x belonging to phi. What does that mean? Phi 0 x is 0. It says phi 0 was probability of rejecting h naught. It says you reject h naught, whatever may be the sample point, you reject h naught with probability 0. So that means you're not rejecting h naught. Or you always do not reject h naught. This test says always do not reject h naught whatever may be the configuration. Let us consider another test, phi 1, which is 1 for every x prime. What is this? This says? This says you reject H0 with probability 1, whatever x prime. So this test is other extreme, which always rejects H0 without looking at the data. Whatever the may be the data point, it always rejects H0. What is the phi 0 test? Whatever may be the data point, it never rejects such naught because probability of rejecting such naught is zero. Note that phi zero and phi one are no data test. I call them as a no data test because they do not use any information contained in the data. Where phi zero never rejects such naught because probability of rejecting such naught is zero, and phi one always rejects such naught. So here, look at what is the probability of two kind of errors for both of these tests. So let us look at probability of type 1 error, which is beta phi naught f, which is basically expected value of f naught under f. That means probability of rejecting h naught when h naught is 2. But phi is 0, so expected value of phi naught f would be 0 for every f line to p 0. In fact, whether f. Right, so, uh, so I should write here f. What is the probability of type 2 error? Which is 1 minus beta phi naught f. But phi naught is 0, always. So beta phi naught f would be 0. So this would be 1 minus 0, which is 1 for every f. So for this test phi 0, probability of type 1 error is 0. So the, to the lowest possible extent one can have. Whereas probability of type 2 error is very high, almost 1. It is 1, in fact. One cannot have probability of type probability more than 1. So it is the maximum possible to type 2 error. Although the pipe, type 1 error was the minimum one in this case. Let us look at what happens with the test 5 one. With the test 5 one, the roles are interesting because 5 one is 1 all the time. So probability of type 1 error, which is beta 5 1 f, which is same as expected value of 5 one under f, but phi 1 is always 1, so this is 1. What is the probability of type 2 error? 1 minus beta phi f, 0 for f to phi. So that means if one has to minimize the type 1 error, this test phi naught x is equal to 0, looks like a, the best possible test one can have. Whereas if one has to minimize the type 2 error, then phi 1 is the best possible test one can have. And you can see these are highly unreasonable tests because they do not use the data at all. They take the other extremes, very lazy tests. It always rejects H0. It always does not reject H0. Sorry, it always, phi 1 x is equal to 1 always rejects H0. It never rejects H0. So you see there is a trade-off between the two. In fact, in general, also, you would see there would be a critical reason. So if you have to minimize one type of error, the critical reason has to be squeezed or made smaller. So if critical reason is made smaller, the power function is anyway decreasing. So power function is decreasing. For f belonging to p1, it becomes a power. So that would also decrease. 
So if you decrease for type one error, power decreases or the type two error would increase normally. So clearly the test phi naught is the best test as far as minimization of type one error is concerned. And the worst possible test for minimization of type two error because for type, it's type two error is one. So best if you have to minimize type one error and if your goal was to minimize type two error, then phi naught is the best possible test one can have. Similarly, the test phi one is the best test for minimizing type two error and the worst test for minimizing type one error. So you see a trade-off between uh, minimizing the two kinds of errors. Let us consider another example. Suppose X has a binomial distribution with number of trials as N and success probability as theta, where theta belonging to zero one is unknown and N greater than zero is a known in T0. Consider testing H naught that theta less than or equal to theta naught against the alternative hypothesis that theta is bigger than theta naught. Where theta naught is a fixed value which is given to you thus. For example, theta naught will be half. Example, I could be given that theta naught is half. Now, since theta is a probability of success, how probability of success gets captured in the data? It looks as the number of successes I get in the data. Since large value of theta are captured in the data through large values of x by n or x, which is number of successes, a reasonable test would be one which rejects alternative hypothesis, which rejects null hypothesis, because alternative hypothesis theta is large. So that means number of successes or proportion of successes would be large under alternative hypothesis. So you would reject H naught for large values of X or X by N. So a class of reasonable test functions is phi J. Which is what is phi J? Phi rejects for large value. What is that threshold of a large? It is de determined through this subscript J. So I, phi J X is a test which rejects for large values of J plus one, J plus two, and then zero otherwise, and so on. Among these tests, let us try to see what are the two types of error. So consider minimizing the risk function with respect to phi. What is risk function? It is expected value of beta phi theta, which is the probability of type one error. Type one error would occur when theta is less than or equal to theta naught. That means rejecting H naught when H naught is true. And the second error occurs which is one minus beta phi theta, then theta is bigger than theta. That is an alternative hypothesis. So let us look at uh, uh, the risk of this test phi z. So R phi z theta would be expected value of beta phi theta for theta between theta and theta naught. In that case, this would be zero. And this would be same as expected value phi z theta. Expected value phi z theta, because it is a randomized, non-randomized test, it would be probability that X is J plus one, J plus two, or so on, which is equivalent to saying that probability that X is greater than equal to J plus one. What would be expected value of one minus phi J theta? That would be the risk for theta between theta naught to one, because in that case, this part would be zero and the risk function would probably run through this, which is one minus beta phi J theta. One minus beta phi J theta is one minus one is zero, so this is one, one minus zero is one time probability that X less than equals. So this is the risk function of the test phi Z. Let us look at K and less than J and compare phi J with phi. So let K is less than J, K and J lying between zero to N minus one. Then the difference of the risk between phi J and phi K is, if theta is between theta to theta naught, what would be this quantity? This would be same as probability that X is greater than equal to J plus one minus probability that X is greater than equal to K plus one. And what would be this? Because K was smaller. So K plus one over here and J plus one over here. This probability is X is greater than equal to J plus one minus X is greater than equal to K plus one. So this is a bigger probability. So that is why this minus of probability that X is bigger than K 
and less than equal to zero. Now, in this situation, probability in this situation, this would be the same as probability that x less than equal to j minus probability that x less than equal to k. So it would be probability x. So in this case, k would be over here, j would be over here, x less than equal to j minus x less than equal to k. So that would be same as x is bigger than k less than equal to j. So in this case, if I look at the difference of the risk between 5j and 5k, for theta less than theta naught, it is less than zero. For theta greater than theta naught, it is greater than zero. So depending on whether you're talking about type one error, which is for theta less than theta naught, or type two error, which is for theta greater than theta naught, phi j is better or phi k is better depends on whether you're talking about type one error or type two error. So for one kind of error, phi j is better, one kind of error, phi k is better because for one of the type of error, which is type one error, risk of phi j is smaller than risk of phi k. That means phi j is better. For the other kind of error, which is when theta is in the alternative hypothesis, the risk difference is positive. So that means risk of phi j is bigger than risk of phi k. So here phi k is better than phi j. So here's neither phi j nor phi k is better than the other. Thus controlling the two errors simultaneously does not seem feasible. So it is totally an impossible task to minimize both kind of errors simultaneously. So what is a way out? A way out is assign a smaller upper bound to one of the error probabilities. So I control one of the error probabilities, say probability of type one error. So beta phi, beta phi f for f belonging to b. So I put an upper bound on one kind of error, then attempt to minimize the other kind of error, which is type two error. Now minimizing type two error is same as maximizing the power, which is one minus type two error for F belonging to B. So that could be one approach. So what I do is I put an upper bound on one kind of error. I say that, look, this is the maximum I can afford as far as type one error is concerned. Then among all such tests, when I have controlled one type of error, I look at all the tests for which this error bound is achieved. That means their type one error is less than equal to this. Then among them, I try to choose the best one. Best one in the sense that among all those tests, I try to find the one for which the type two error is minimum. And that makes sense because I cannot minimize both kinds of errors simultaneously. So let tau, is correction of all those stress functions for which beta phi f for f belonging to p0, which is the probability of type one error, is less than equal to f. So it says rather than considering all the tests, let us consider all, only those tests for which type one error is less than equal to f. So note that by doing this, I've gotten rid of tests of the type phi zero is equal to zero. Sorry, phi zero is equal to one, because for that, beta phi one f is always one, and one less than equal to alpha will not be satisfied. So I've controlled one type of error that it cannot exceed beyond this threshold. And then there may be a lot of tests which satisfy this, that is for whom the type one error would be less than equal to alpha. I try to find out a goal phi star for which probability of type two error is minimum. What is the probability of type two error? Beta phi star f for f belonging to p1 is bigger than or equal to beta phi f belonging to. So this is not type two error, this is a power, right? So power is maximum. So beta phi star f is greater than equal to beta phi star f, which is equivalent to saying that type two error, which is beta phi star one, sorry, one minus beta phi star of f, is smaller than one minus beta phi of f, which is the probability of type two error for f prime to p1, which is equivalent to saying that the power for phi star is maximum. Now this bound of alpha, which has to be pre-specified because that depends on the experimenter that how much threshold you want to put, is called the level of significance. 
the size of the test is actually the maximum possible time for an error. Right? What is this? This is a, because for f belonging to p zero, beta phi f is probability of rejecting h naught when h naught is true. It's a probability of type two error. Type one error. So these are maximum possible type one error for the test phi. Note that this may not be same as level of significance because level of significance, you're saying that I want to test that it's type one error is less than I could have. So this bound may not be a T, right? This may be actually larger. The size may actually be a larger than the level of significance because size is same as the supremum of beta phi f. Now, one natural question which would come to anybody's mind is that, look, if I have to put a bound, I would like to put a bound as zero, as type one error. But that will not solve your problem because if you put type one error bound as zero, then you know the best test is phi is equal to zero, which always rejects not. For which type one error is one. It is because there is a trade-off between the type one error and type two error. So if you try to make it at zero, the type one error, type, type two uh, error of the best test would be one. It would be best, but it would be zero because you're not compromising on your type one error. You want type one error to be less than equal. Right? So one has to very carefully and judiciously decide what should be the level of significance. If you get too ambitious and say that, look, I can't afford type one error more than zero. It has to be totally error free. You can do that, but it will come at a cost of a very high type two error, which is one, right? So normally what one does is one puts a reasonable value of alpha. So normally commonly used values of alphas are 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0 0.001. These are the level, uh, level of significance which is. And then I try to find out the test for which the type two error is minimum. Uh, so let us see this note, the level of significance alpha should lie in the interval zero to one. Because if alpha is equal to zero, one would like to do that if one is very ambitious as far as type one error is concerned. Then beta phi f is less than or equal to zero for every f nine p zero would imply that expected value of phi x is zero, which means the probability that phi x equal to zero is one for every f belonging to p zero. And in most situations, such a test would always reject this norms. In fact, in most situations, such a test would be nothing but, it's always rejects this norm, whatever x may be. So probability of type two error would be, which is would be one minus expected value of this would be one. So I choose my level of significance judiciously. I do not choose it too low so that I get a trivial test phi x equal to zero for which the type one error probability is one. Type two probability is one. What we observe is if I are willing to compromise a bit on my alpha, then I can get a reasonable test for which probability of type two error is also reasonably small. Now note that if you follow such a strategy that you reject, that you put a bound on type one error and try to minimize the type two error, what may happen over there? You know that, it, for example, if you put alpha is equal to 0 0.0, you know, 0 0.05, you know that the chances of making error of type one are not more than 0 0.05. So only in 5% of the cases at the worst, you'll make an error of type one error. But it doesn't talk about anything about type two error. It says type two error would be minimum, but that minimum itself may be very low, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So what it suggests is by following this strategy, I'm only convinced 
that my type one error is under control. So what is under control? That error of rejecting H naught is under control. So that means wrongly rejecting H naught is in control. So that means using this test, I will not be wrongly rejecting H naught with very high probability. So what it suggests? It suggests that if I use this test, only thing which is ensured to us is this test will not reject H naught with high probability. In fact, probability of rejecting H naught, wrongly rejecting H naught is very small. So if this test concludes that reject H naught, I should confidently reject H naught because I know the chances of this test wrongly rejecting H naught are very small, which is 0 0.04. But if this test concludes that do not reject H naught, then I cannot say anything because it says do not reject H naught and probability of wrong decision of this kind, that means probability of wrongly not rejecting H naught is not in control. It could be very small. It, could be, it is minimum, I know, but that minimum could be, uh, it's said very high. Type two error. So when I use such a test, I frame my hypothesis in such a way that only type one error is more serious than the type two error. So that is the role of statistics and comes that how should you frame your hypothesis? Because this philosophy only controls the type one error. That means wrongly rejecting H naught. So that means you should frame your hypothesis in such a way that the chances of rejecting H naught is more serious than wrongly accepting H naught. And that is what it says, we frame our null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis in such a way that the error of wrongly rejecting the H naught is considered to be more serious than error of wrongly not rejecting H naught because by doing so I have controlled the serious error. Because here the, wrong, the error of wrongly rejecting H naught is considered more serious, which I have controlled at level 0 0.05, at level alpha. By doing so, we guarantee that the probability of the error, which is more serious, is bounded above a desired level alpha. Note that the above formulation does not guarantee upper bound on probability of type two error, which may be large. Thus, one should be very careful in the use of tests, which is optimal under the above formulation as it does not guarantee upper bound on type two error probability. It only guarantees upper bound on type one error probability. Thus, if such an optimal test rejects H naught, one may actually conclude the rejection of H naught because I know that probability of wrongly rejecting H naught are very small. However, if it does not reject H naught, but would not like to accept H naught, at the best, one could conclude that there is not enough evidence to reject H naught. You will not accept H naught. You would say that there is not enough evidence to reject H naught. In short, under the above formulation, if the optimal test does not reject H naught, then one must make sure that the probability of type two error or the power are not large. Probability of type two error is not large or the power is not small before accepting H0. So that is why it says that if your test concludes reject H0, you blindly reject H0 because normally your alpha would be small, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. So you're sure that you're not making a type one error in using test five. But if it doesn't conclude that reject H0, then do not blindly accept H0 before seeing what is the power of the test. So to see this, let us consider this example. Suppose I have sample x1, x2, xn, which is normal theta one, where theta belonging to real line is unknown. Consider testing h naught that theta is less than or equal to zero against that theta is greater than zero. Note that x bar is complete and sufficient and hence minimal sufficient stretch for theta. 
it is reasonable to consider the class phi alpha. So when you are rejecting H0, but theta is large because H0 says that theta is smaller than zero, H1 says that theta is larger than zero. So a reasonable test would reject H0 for larger values of sample mean because larger values of theta get captured in the sample mean through its larger values. So a reasonable test would be reject H0 if X bar is bigger than C alpha and zero if X bar is less than equal to C alpha. How do I choose C alpha? I choose C alpha so that the test has level of significance alpha. Or in other words, we want a test for which expected value of phi alpha x which is equal to phi of cx, which is probably that x bar is greater than c, is less than equal to alpha. For every theta in null hypothesis, null hypothesis means theta less than equal to zero. What does that mean? Proti x bar greater than c is this thing. That means proti x bar less than equal to c is greater than equal to one minus alpha. Proti x bar greater than equal to c for theta less than equal to zero is this. Now this would happen for every theta less than equal to zero. This is a decreasing function of a theta. So this would be greater than equal to one minus alpha for every if infimum of this quantity. So infimum of theta, because something is greater than equal to one minus alpha for every theta, that would happen only when infimum of these quantities is bigger than equal to one minus alpha. So that means infimum over theta greater than equal to zero of phi of root n c minus theta is greater than equal to one minus alpha. But phi is a distribution function and here theta is coming with a minus sign and distribution functions is, all, is always increasing. It is a decreasing function of a theta. So it is decreasing function of theta. That means it's infimum would be, sorry, this is theta less than zero, would be attained when theta is maximum, which is zero. So that means phi of root n c would be greater than equal to one minus alpha which is equivalent to saying that because phi is an increasing function, so this is going to equal to c bigger than equal to one upon root 10, phi inverse of one minus alpha. One such choice is I choose c to be exactly one upon root 10, phi inverse of one. For n is equal to 25 and alpha is equal to 0 0.05, one can find out this from the tables. It turns out to be one upon square root 25, which is phi, phi inverse of one minus alpha, which is 0 0.95, phi inverse of 1.95 is 1.65 divided by five, which turns out to be 0 0.33. So level alpha test turns out to be one if x bar is bigger than 0 0.33 and zero if x less than equal to 0 0.33. So if your sample mean, observed sample mean is bigger than 0 0.33, you should blindly reject S0 because you know that probability of wrongly rejected H0 is very small. At the first, it could be 0 0.05. But if you do not reject H0, that means if your X bar turns out to be less than 0 0.33, then you do not accept H0. What you try to do is you try to look at the power of the test, which is probability of rejecting H0 when H1 is true. Probability of rejecting H0 means X bar greater than 0 0.33. H1 is true, that means Theta is bigger than zero, which is same as one minus phi of x bar less than or equal to 0 0.33, which is root 10, 0 0.33 minus theta, which is one minus phi, phi of 0 0.33 minus theta. This is a power. Now, of course, this power depends on what is the point theta you're considering in the alternative hypothesis, because the alternative hypothesis has more than one theta, which is any theta greater than zero. So depending on which theta point you're taking in the alternative hypothesis, your power varies. And since this is a decreasing function of theta with a minus, it becomes an increasing function of a theta, it becomes an increasing function of a theta. So the minimum power would be attained when theta is near zero, that means theta is equal to zero. And theta is equal to zero, you can see that this probability turns out to be 0 0.05, which is same as the level of the test, which is okay because at theta is equal to zero, beta phi, theta was 0 0.05. And as theta moves away from zero, which is the threshold for the null hypothesis, the power increases. And as theta goes to infinity, it becomes one. So your power would be 
very good if theta is very far away from zero. And that makes sense because if theta is far away from zero, that means there is a clear cut distinction between H naught and H one because H naught says theta less than equal to zero and H one theta is some large quantity, let us say 15. So in such a test situation, this test looks like a very good test because it will give you a very high power, but I do not know where the theta is. So power could be as low as 0 0.05, which is same as level of significance. So near theta is equal to zero, power is very low, but for theta far away from zero, power is large. For example, if I look at the power at 0 0.4, which is not very far away from zero, what is power at 0 0.4? One minus five times 0 0.33 minus 0.4, and you try to see that, that ends up in minus 0.35 which is 5 up 0.35, which is 0.6368. So at theta is equal to 0 0.5, the power is high. Reasonably high, not very high, theta 0.6368, which was 0 0.05, when the alternative hypothesis point was at zero. So I cannot say anything about the power, and that's the reason when any test under the above formulation rejects such not, I am very sure that I can reject H naught because the type one error, which is a property of wrongly rejecting H naught, is controlled. But if my test function under the above formulation does not reject H naught, we should not blindly accept H naught. This is a common mistake which a lot of these practitioners make. They say your test is not rejecting H naught, so you accept H naught. That is wrong because you have not seen the power. And you have seen, for example, in this case, if you follow such a philosophy, your power could be 0 0.05. Or type 1 error could be 0 0.95. Would you like to have a type 1 error 0.95? No. So this test helps us only in rejecting it not. And you frame your hypothesis in such a way that your Type 1 error is more serious than the type 2 error. So let me stop uh, uh, over here. If any one of you have any questions, uh, I would be glad to uh, answer those. Any answers? Any questions anybody has? Okay, if there are uh, no questions, uh, uh, others may leave and those who want to stay back for any questions or clarifications, uh, I would be glad to provide any clarifications. Sagar and Rosen, anything you want to discuss? Uh, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yes, sir. I had some doubts. I uh, wanted to. I was. Uh, uh, I was compiling some of them. I was uh, 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 requesting, like, if it's possible, I can. Uh, meet sometime and, and discuss all my doubts. Yeah, sure. No problems. When do you want to come? Uh, if you want to come to my office, are you on campus or? I'm on campus. You can come to my office sometime. You can keep okay. tomorrow afternoon if it suits you. Sir, uh, this week, sir, I have some uh, submission of reports. It would be good if it be end that's, of this that's week. That's fine. Later, later week also. Anytime when you want to meet me, just let okay, me know. Okay, I'll, I'll, mail, I'll mail you, sir. You can meet either personally or physically or even uh, Zoom is also fine. Anything which suits you, let me know. Okay. And I would be okay. glad to tell sir, you. Sir, I also wanted to ask one thing. Sir, how, like, this is a, a, like a very abstract question. I wanted to ask, like, how are the study of uh, these uh, uh, Inference is uh, useful in statistics. How is it uh, useful? Uh, uh, what are the applications of these studies that we are so doing? So any, any, you see what you, when you do, uh, the cat, 
the first thing which you do in statistics is the modeling part, right? You try to model your population, right? Yes, sir. Right. Now, suppose you have modeled a population. Now, in this course, I have I am mainly dealing with the statistical inference problems, which are parametric in nature. Okay. Parametric means your population is described in terms of a PDF whose functional form, function. whose functional exactly. form I know. I may not okay. know the parameter, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So, for example, let us say you model uh, about the height of students. Through your data, you get you make a histogram, and it looks like a normal histogram, right? Because yes, it's well saved, and so it may be uh, there may be a reasonable grounds to assume normality. The parameter I may not uh, know, right? Yes. So one may be interested in testing the hypothesis that uh, mean height is bigger than or equal to five foot ten inches, right? Mm -hmm. Make that inference. Okay. Okay. I do not know. Now, one may say that naively, uh, I calculate the sample mean, and if it is, turns out to be bigger than 5.10, then I'll take that. But then, how okay. do you know that? How do you know such a. You see, a layman may would do that, right? Because yes, sir. layman asks, he says, Are, why, what is a big deal about this using statistics in this? I will mm -hmm. calculate the sample mean. If sample mean turns out to be bigger than 5.10, I will reject mm -hmm. it. But the question is, who would validate that such a decision or such a decision taken is a valid yes, decision, sir. is a good decision? Sir, my doubt is that uh, I understand this in case of parametric uh, problems. Like, right. uh, but right. uh, in real life data, there is uh, no such uh, parametric, no, uh, parametric uh, form of the problem known. We just have uh, observations. Yeah, so but the, you you get the model as I said. The first thing which you do is the modeling part. You try to mm -hmm. model. If you can model your population in a parametric form, then all okay. these parametric inference. Okay, 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 okay. We try to model it in that form, and then we okay, okay. As I said, no. You have a data through data. Okay. You, a nav thing is first thing you look at the histogram. Right? So, but sir, what are the ways to like? Are there a, a, that modeling part is very uh, subjective. To, uh, it the... is subjective. So, for example, uh, for example, uh, the basic thing, but the basic thing is the same. The basic thing is, I want to see what how does a PDF looks like. Uh -huh. right? It's okay. a continuous value, right? Okay, 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 sir. I understand. I understand. Oh, okay. Uh, because all the information is contained in the PDF. <laughs> yes, it may sir. be totally or completely unknown to me, or it may be known in a partial form that is a parametric form. Yes, sir. But this partially known is also coming from a partial information, which is from the past data or the present data. Yeah, whatever. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. So it is. Uh, uh, so all these courses are connected, right? So this course only deals with where you have you can model your data in a parametric form. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. Once you do that, then you know I have studied various estimation procedures and by estimation you want to get a by estimator how to go about it. You have to test mm -hmm. certain hypotheses, how to go about it. And that is what we are doing over here. Okay. Thank and you. And not only that, if mm -hmm. you look at the philosophy which I told today, that look, when I'm doing this testing problem, I cannot mm -hmm. control both kinds of errors. Right? Yes, sir. There's a trade-off between the two kinds of errors. You try to minimize the one, the other goes up. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What is a reasonable way to do it? I look at look. I look at first. I identify which error is more serious to me. Hmm. For example, if somebody says that there is a new manufacturing system, you employ a new manufacturing system, and I am a manager of a company, or I am a owner of a company. Hmm. Yes, sir. Right. So my first hypothesis would be: so my seriousness, which error would be more serious? My error would be more serious if I accept this new plant, whereas the mean mm -hmm. output of this plant may not be larger than the existing plant. Existing plant, yes, sir. Right, that is more serious. So what I do is, so for me, wrongly rejecting H0 is more serious. So I make my uh, null hypothesis as status quo. That means the new one is same as the existing one, right? The output of the... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the new one is same as the existing one against the output of the output of new one is larger than the existing one right that is a, mm -hmm. these are the two possible scenarios now here wrongly rejecting h not means yes sir 
I am saying that new one is better than the existing one, but although it is not. Uh -huh, yes, sir. That is more serious, right? Yes, sir. Now, this is a philosophical question, which a practitioner normally do is he just uses a tool. He would, be, he would give him a software and he will apply your mm -hmm. test. He yes, sir. Not, he, will, he will not go into this nitty gritty that look by how these hypotheses have been framed. Exactly. This test helps in developing statistical thinking also. Okay. Does that make sense for you? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's all? Yes, sir. Okay.